Okay, I think it's safe. I bought a variable speed Manila duh, and this video is gonna be long-winded. If you're just looking to cut to the chase, and I can respect that, but if you're even asking or thinking about buying a lathe like this, the answer is yes, just buy one. These things can be a lot of fun. However, the rest of this video is about qualifying that answer. I've always said any lathe is better than no lathe, but you should know what you're getting into. So yes, I bought a mini lathe. Now that it's really here, I'm not exactly sure why. This thing is cute though, I have to give it that. In a sort of the feral cat in my bushes just had kittens and I don't know what to do with them now kind of way. I've always gotten a lot of questions about which lathe to get and these mini lathes were always quite popular. I mean, in terms of lathes, I'd get asked about. And despite what it says on the About Me page, I'm not a lathe genealogist, but I get it. And in this case, I literally got it. I really only just broke the box down. I wouldn't quite call it a crate, but the lathe did show up in one piece, more or less, and it does run. I powered it on once. Going by the smell, when I opened the box, it was a 50-50 shot of it actually working. This is my way of taking one for the team. Not necessarily in a derogatory behind the dumpster in an alley sort of way. I already have a lathe and am in no immediate need of another one. My impulse is to say something snarky, like this isn't really a lathe, that it's just one more clever ruse to separate you from your money. And while it is true, I'm going to try to be fair. And full disclosure, I do have one or two skeletons in my closet. This is the lathe I started out with. I mean, not this one exactly, but the same bloodline. I've mentioned this before more than a few times, but despite all the toys you see on this channel, this is purely a hobby for me, and we all start somewhere. As you get better, or more familiar rather, with what you like, what you'd like to do, and how you'd like to do it, well, you start to slowly climb that ladder, one rung at a time towards that shop or tool or whatever you've always wanted. Now, sometimes that ladder breaks, and when it does, they take all those broken pieces and make a lathe like this. Okay, I'm sorry, it's stronger than me. The pot shots are just too easy. When I started with one of these, I had a lot of fun and believe it or not, even made useful parts. But we'll get into that shortly. The very first thing you should do if you get one of these is to bolt it down to something solid. I'd recommend pouring a giant concrete block with anchors sticking out the top, but a heavy bench should do. You do get a bag of stuff when you get one of these, but they don't include any rigidity with the lathe. If your lathe wobbles when you try to turn the knobs or just generally look in its direction, stop what you're doing and bolt it down to something solid. Take it apart maybe a little more carefully than that. If you looked up World of Difference and there was a picture to go with that, this would be it. It's already starting to feel like a different lathe. Now, at this point, the lathe should be leveled, or have the twist removed, rather. You'd maybe do that by shimming under the anchor points with some washers, perhaps. I have a video on lathe leveling if you're interested. I'm not going to bother to do that here. That's its own entire topic, and this isn't the lathe's final resting place anyway. I'm not shooting for precision at this point. I just want to see what this thing can do. You shouldn't spin up a lathe with nothing in the chuck or with no tension on the jaws. I don't know if that's an old wives tale, but I wouldn't do it unless you really trusted your chuck. I'm not standing in front of this, by the way. I won't lie, that was a little bit frightening. That's 2,500 RPM according to the dial. That's twice as fast as my big lathe can spin. You know what, let's measure that. So the published speed is 50 to 2,500 RPM. Start out on the lowest setting. I'm getting about 80 there. Let's try 2,500. About 21, 2,200. And it's not getting any less scary. 
This is the 7x14 mini lathe, straight from the golden shores of China. I didn't expect to be showing you this until the new year, but this thing moves pretty fast. Got it in three weeks, maybe a month. Faster than I expected at any rate. Anyway, 7x14 indicates the maximum capacity of the lathe. In this case, 7 inch diameter by 14 inch long between centers. Between centers means no chuck. You have to use lathe centers to get that capacity. Now just to clarify, that's the maximum size of something that would physically fit in this machine. But of course, you wouldn't load a 7 inch diameter by 14 inch long piece of steel on this, which would weigh about 150 pounds by the way. You can get smaller versions. There's a 7x12 and a very popular 7x10. Now, I could have sworn there used to be 7x16 inch lathes, and that's really what I was looking for, but it appears they're all 8 inch lathes now. Maybe I was dreaming that number. The reason you want more bed length isn't because you'd necessarily want to be working on something that long, but once you get a chuck on there and put some tooling in the tailstock, you can run out of that space pretty darn fast. This is the smaller drill chuck from my larger lathe. Now, I don't have a Morse 2 adapter to put in this tailstock stock, but a comparable chuck would be about this size, maybe a smidge smaller. And this is a quarter inch drill, just for scale, about six millimeters. Hopefully you can make out with just the drill chuck and the lathe chuck, I'm really only left with, I don't know, six inches, 150 millimeters, maybe a little bit more. And this is the 7x14 lathe. If you had the 7x10, you'd be missing four more inches there. Now in some machines you can mitigate that by putting the material down into the chuck through the spindle bore. For example, this is longer than I could hold on the capacity of this lathe, but I can kind of stick it down the bore, clamp it there, and work on it close to the chuck. The limitation on a smaller machine like this is that spindle bore isn't very big. Here it's about 20 millimeters, three quarters of an inch. So if you do work smaller than that, you can push it down into the spindle and work on just the ends. If it's larger than that, you have to work across the bed. I went with this one because it was the absolute cheapest one I could find. Now, these all come from China. The other versions and colors you see of these lathes are just relabeled, rebranded. Maybe some quality control gets done by third parties before you see it. Maybe you get some additional accessories, but they're all from probably the same place in China. And getting this right from the horse's mouth cost me about $550. Shipping sent me back about 70. For argument's sake, let's say that's 700 bucks all in. If you think that initial investment in lathe hurt, well, you ain't seen nothing yet. With time, what you spent on your lathe will pale in comparison to the tooling that you'll accumulate. Case in point, after ordering the lathe, I decided to get a quick change tool post, and isn't that just the cutest thing you've ever seen? And I got some insert tooling. Now, the tool post on the machine is fine. It'll do its job just fine. Actually, let's go look at it. There's the tool post. Cute little tool post, nothing wrong with it. Raise the screws, put your lathe tool in there, clamp them down. Now again, these are fine, you can have a blast with these, but you'll soon run into the inconvenience of not being able to adjust your tool height. Once you lay your tool in there and clamp it down, however tall your tool is, that's your tool height. With the quick change tool posts, you can move that entire tool up and down to coincide with the lathe center line. So you're cutting on center. With this type of tool post, if you have a tool that's a little too short, you're going to have to shim up underneath it. If it's a little too big, you'll have to get out the angle grinder and carefully drop the tool until you match the center height. Now, even that, frankly, isn't that big of a deal, as long as you only have four tools. As soon as you have another one and you want to swap it in, well, now you got to start keeping track of which tools go with which shims. I don't know. It's not very convenient. I think I could have bought the slightly smaller one, but I think I can make that work. That's going to require a bushing, maybe a different bolt, probably a bushing. I don't know if this is going to fit. Yep, just barely. And now I could drop in any tool I like, adjust the height once for center line, lock the tool in place, and then whenever I remove that tool and put it back, it'll always be back at the same height. Again, it's purely convenience. Now this thing, with again, four tool holders, also import, sent me back $150. And the indexable tooling, with a couple of boxes of inserts, I think was another 100. So 250 bucks, which now puts me at half the price of the lathe. On the back end, it has a cam lock for the tailstock. That's pretty nice. 
I remember the lathe I had had a nut down at the bottom. Total pain in the butt. There was never enough clearance for the wrench, and you move this thing more often than you might think. The lever just rotates an eccentric pin that puts tension on that bolt and locks the tailstock down to the bed. Out of the box, it did need a little bit of adjustment, but it's just a nut you tighten up a bit on the bottom. In fact, I might have tightened it too much. The lead screw is a little more anemic than what I seem to remember, but the threads do appear fully formed. They are Acme threads, but... If they were a little bit bigger, that might have been nicer. The lathe uses this screw for both thread cutting and power feed. When you engage the half nut, you're basically clamping onto that threaded rod, and then as it spins, it drags the carriage along. This one has no thread dial. That means you can't disengage the half nut if you're cutting threads. You'll have to reverse the lathe to move the cutting tool to the beginning, and then reverse it again to make the next cut. The scale from the compound is just a, looks like a chromed piece of plastic, just bolted to the front. One thing I didn't remember, and what I don't like, is that to change this angle, you have to retract the entire top slide to get access to a pair of screws that loosen that plate. Now you might be thinking, what's the big deal? I mean, how often do you swing the top slide? Well, if you could swing it to the exact angle that you needed and locked it down, I mean, I guess it's not that big of an inconvenience. Setting a top slide usually takes a lot of iterations. So say you want to set it to 30 degrees, you turn this, lock it down at your best guess, and then you'd have to start sweeping with an indicator to see how close you were. Then maybe loosen it, bump it a bit, tighten it back down, sweep again. Having to retract the entire compound or top slide every time, yeah, not super. I don't know if you can make it out, but those gibs probably need a little bit of tightening. Though there probably wasn't that much gib left when fully retracted. I was also shocked to find that a low-cost import machine doesn't have power crossfeed. So if you do a lot of facing, you'll be doing that by hand. Or make an adapter for your cordless drill. I don't see any immediate way to lock the carriage. Usually there's a screw somewhere to lock it down. In case you're taking some heavier facing cuts, you don't want the load from cutting to slowly push your carriage back and you end up with a domed or a conical face. Though something like that's probably not that hard to add. Drill a hole, add a big flange nut on the bottom. Under the cover, we've got the drivetrain for the lead screw. So the spindle is driven with a DC motor, it's back here in the bottom, via a timing belt. The timing belt looks like it sneaks up behind this aluminum casting. Yeah, you could just see the belt back there. So that's your spindle speed. That motor speed is controlled by the knob on the top here. And the rest of this junk does all the gearing to get the lead screw to turn at the right proportion, at the right ratio, to your spindle. How fast that lead screw turns in relation to that spindle determines your feed rate or the thread pitch that you're cutting. And likely the most contentious issue is that they're using plastic gears. That's not necessarily the end of the world, but we'll get to that in a second. Something I don't like is the placement of the tumbler here in the back of the machine. When you throw this lever, it introduces another gear in the gear train that reverses the direction of the lead screw. So if you want to thread or face away from the chuck, you'd have to flip that lever. Maybe you're not flipping the direction of your lead screw very often, but having a control on the back of the machine just seems awkward to me. So here's what I got with my lathe. There are some tools. There's the chuck key. I was wondering why the one I was using didn't fit so great. I was using the one for my fourth axis on the CNC router. Anyway, tools, the other set of jaws for the chuck. I'm not sure, I guess these might be mounting feet for the lathe. Not sure what those extra screws are for. You get a little nasal wash bottle, that's nice of them. It comes in handy if you turn a lot of brass or cast iron. And then the chuck guard, the shield that is attached to the micro switch on the chuck. And then the plastic gears. These are change gears. The manual and the cover have instructions, little tables, on which gears to use for which feeds or threads you're trying to move the saddle at. That you want the lathe tool to move in relation to the rotations of the spindle. So you look on the chart, you find the gears that you need, and then you'd install these in place of the plastic gears we saw in the lathe just a moment ago. So these gears are maybe, I don't know, nylon? That might not be a smart choice. M160... I can't read that. Oh, Z60, 60 tooth, POM. 
Okay, so these are acetal gears. So that's better. Acetal is good for gears. Metal would have been nicer. Now you can buy metal gears for these lathes. I did a quick Google search a week or two ago. I think the set was maybe 150 bucks. However, there's nothing inherently wrong with plastic gears. You've got these in your car, in your other power tools, and they could be okay if they're properly designed for the application. So I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt that if you use the lathes within its operating capacity, the gears should hold up some reasonable amount of time. In this situation, I don't think it's so much that the plastic gears are a problem in that they could be dismissed right out of the gate. I think it's more the fact that metal gears, steel gears, would give you, the operator, a little bit more room for error. So on my lathe, for example, the Colchester, if I try to take too heavy of a cut or make some bonehead move and something jams up, you know, the lathe might stall. I mean, more than likely, I'll break a lathe tool, ruin the work, something along those lines, but the lathe would probably stall. In this case, you'll probably split this gear in two or strip the teeth. Then again, it's got a 500 watt motor, so maybe it would stall too. Again, depending how all of this was designed. And to use the change gears, again, you'd consult the manual, find the thread pitch or the feed rate you'd like to work at, read off which gears you need, and then replace them here in the back of the lathe. Now for comparison, my lathe subscribes more to the mixed martial arts philosophy. It does have some change gears in the back behind that cover, but most of the work can be done right here on the gearbox. All those gears that came with the lathe and that Ziploc bag are built into this gearbox. And instead of having to loosen nuts and swap gears, I can just pick a different gear set via this tumbler and the various levers of course. All right, so after all that talking, it's probably high time we tried this thing out. I've got some cold rolled steel in there. It's an inch and a quarter, I think. I don't think that's inch and a half. Bigger than 30 millimeters. I'm going to face and turn this with no end support. The general rule of thumb is about a three to one length to diameter ratio in terms of stick out. Doesn't always work, but close enough. Any more than three to one, and you should think about using a dead center or a live center or some way to hold the work. I haven't done anything to this machine in terms of trying to tune anything up or tighten screws other than anything that was immediately about to fall off. I just want to see what it does right out of the box. It is probably worth going through and snugging up the gibs, cleaning the parts up, adding some oil, stuff like that. I'd expect this lathe to do just fine on brass and bronze and aluminum, that kind of stuff, but I want to try it in steel. I don't know if I said it already, but I'm going to be spinning it at about a thousand RPM and whatever feed rate the gearbox is set up to. Doesn't like that. That might be too much stick out for this lathe. Let me find a shorter piece. All right, same material and diameter, only now I've got a two to one stick out. And I think I'm gonna bump the RPMs up to 1500. We'll start with a five thou depth of cut. You know what? That's rather respectable. That was somewhere between a five and a six thou depth of cut, and I did bump up the speed a little bit for that last pass. I'm gonna do a few more and just try to increase the depth of cut until something bad happens. This is a 10 thou depth of cut. At 10 thou, we're starting to get a little chatter on the end there. Let's try 15. Okay, it didn't like that sudden engagement, but you know, it powered through. Let's try this at top speed, 15 thou depth of cut, just like before. Wow, well how about that? The feed rate was a little too aggressive. I'm surprised. Good show. All right, so we need to slow down the feed rate. I took off the cover and I'm having at the gears here. But get a load of this. We've got a very small gear going to a big gear that's attached to a small gear that's going to a big gear. To get this lead screw to slow down, we need either smaller gears here or bigger gears here. Without even looking at the charts, simply browsing the extensive collection they've provided us with, there's really nothing smaller or anything larger than the gears that are already on the lathe. Ipso exacto, this is as slow as we can get the feed rate to go. Seeing we can't easily adjust the settings for the tool that we want to use, we'll have to change to a tool better suited to what we've got to work with. In this case, I just sharpened a small high-speed steel blank. I'll put this in a tool holder and we'll try this again. For what it's worth, I've also tightened the top slide, the cross slide. It will budge, but 
it's uncomfortable to use. I have essentially locked it out. Now because we're using high speed steel, the spindle speed will drop like an order of magnitude. We'll be at about 100 to 150 RPM. I don't know what the specs on that little DC motor is, but I assume it'll have more torque down here at the lower end than it did at 1000 plus RPM. That first pass was 5 thou, this was 10 thou. It's doing pretty good. Let's go right to 20. It doesn't like 20 at that RPM. Let's try to mix it up a little bit. I'll just bump it up by eye, 200, 220 RPM. That's the spring pass from before. Go down to the minimum. I think we clocked this in at 80 RPM. Again, it's gonna take a spring cut and it won't be 20 thou until it gets to that step. You guys watch that, I'm gonna go have a sandwich. Let's go back to 15 thou and bump the speed up. We've obviously tailed off on the torque on both ends now. This will be about 250 RPM and 15 thou depth of cut. That I think is 20 thou. And I think that's gonna be 25 as soon as it hits that next step. Try 10 thou. Surface finish isn't all that bad. Kind of what you'd expect maybe from high speed steel. Let's try it at 400 RPM, 10 thou depth of cut. This tool probably won't last that long at that chip load, but let's see what happens. All right, so I think that's about all I could get out of this thing. Keep in mind this thing is 550 watts. That's probably less than a travel hairdryer. Surface finish on cold rolled steel is always tricky, but you know what? Those little chips look rather respectable. Okay, let's have a little heart to heart here. My opinion is getting grimmer and grimmer the more time I spend with this. I'm still of the opinion that if you had no other choice, either because of budget or space or undetermined interest in getting a lathe, this is probably still worth throwing $500 away on. I still think it could be a lot of fun with some caveats. First, I wouldn't push this too hard, especially on steel. As you've seen, the poor thing will do it, but you're going to destroy the lathe in no time flat if you don't go easy. If you insist on using something like this for steel, work really close to the chuck and maybe stick with free machining steels. Hot rolled would probably be better than cold rolled, though that stuff can be a bit gummy. You can of course take on bigger projects, but just keep its limitations in mind. If you have the patience of a saint, yes, you could technically use this to turn a three inch steel round into a new gland nut for your leaking hydraulic cylinder, but it's probably the last project a little lathe like this might ever see. Think of it like trying to cut down a tree. Could you do it with a pocket knife? Given some time and determination, I'm sure someone could, but there are better, albeit more expensive ways to do it. And this lathe would end up looking just like I imagine that pocket knife would after it's felled an old oak tree. Flip side, this thing seems to have no problem at all with softer materials. Aluminum, bronze, brass, and plastic of course. I mean you won't be winning any races, but the available power is more suited to softer metals and plastics. And the finish you'll get on softer metals will likely be a lot better than what I've been demonstrating if you take some more time to sharpen your tools and set the machine up for proper cutting speeds. Again, for small projects this thing is great. In a better than nothing sort of way. Or maybe as a general shop tool. Something like this could save your butt more often than you expect. It, turning down small diameters, squaring up pins, cleaning up threads, tuning fits between small parts. Maybe you need something to support your own prototype build. Or you've got 
I don't know, a small engine shop, something where turning isn't the primary work you do, I bet you'll find yourself walking over to something like this a lot. But the trade-off is time. There's a lot more babysitting you need to do with a lathe like this. And well, if you start dumping more money into it, well, just try to do the math ahead of time. Maybe another three or four hundred bucks up front gets you a better investment. Which brings us full circle back to the plastic gears. Remember that thing I said about well-designed? Well, this isn't that, unfortunately. In editing the video, I noticed a crack in the big gear after my very first cut. It hasn't completely failed, but it's probably not long for this earth. And when I went to change to these gears to cut the threads, I realized why that crack was probably there. The bores and key seats in these gears, at least on my set, are consistently undersized. These are molded gears, of course, and the internal features are undersized. I had to literally pry the big ones out and tap these other ones on with a hammer. Delicately, of course. But as I tapped them on, the steel shaft and keys these are mounted on sheared their way through, like they pushed out a little wisp of plastic. Consequently, they're now on there pretty tight, which means they're stressed. The big gear probably was right from the factory, and with time or first use in my case, the stress found a nice stress riser in the corner of the keyway and has started cracking the gear. If this is the case for all these mini lathes, spend a few more bucks, get the version that comes with metal gears. If you'd rather not spend the cash, I'd rig up some other way to power feed. Maybe add a small DC motor or variable electric drill to the other end of the lead screw. Leave the plastic gears out altogether and drive the carriage with another motor. Now that wouldn't cover your backside for thread cutting though. And while we're on the topic, and standing here at my fine specimen of a lathe, I couldn't drive the higher gear ratios to get me to a coarser thread. Like, I didn't want to demo a thread as fine as I did. That's just not good showmanship. But speeding up the carriage for a coarser thread means a higher gear ratio, more movement of the cutting tool for every turn of the spindle, which requires more torque from the motor. More torque than this motor has to spare. If I was committed to this, I'd probably upgrade the motor with something bigger, like a big DC motor and speed controller from your neighbor's treadmill. I mean, come on, you know they're just using it as a coat rack. So all told, would I recommend this lathe? Honestly, I don't know what to tell you, other than the answer is complicated. If this was my only option, the answer is a resounding yes. But get the one with the metal gears. It's a fun little lathe and there are a ton of projects you can do on it. Not to mention there's an absolutely huge community out there and tons of info on mods, fixes, improvements, and tuning to get the most out of it. But you have to have the discipline to stick to doing smaller projects or you may as well have thrown your cash out the window. And now honestly, what are the odds that it really happened? I mean, once you have it, come on, you know the lathe is where everyone vents their aggression. And me? Well, apart from this little review slash nostalgic reunion, my plan is to break this lathe down physically, psychologically, and emotionally, and build it back up into a small CNC lathe, just for kicks. But that's a project for another time. For now, thanks for watching. Hey, wait a minute. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Could I use this little lathe to jump back in time and buy the version with metal gears? Give me a minute. It was a little tricky. Not a lot of space to work with in here, and as we saw, quite a few bits made out of plastic. But I think I got the eigenstate of the fermion's wave function correct in the density matrix of the Hilbert space to initiate quantum tunneling. And right, I'm going to put it in reverse since we're going backwards in time. Now 50 days should be more than enough, but as we saw, the minimum here is 80, so I'll be doing some standing around. But here goes nothing. Uh, not what I expected to happen. Did I install the... Oh, wait a minute, this might be okay. I think I know what happened here. Oh.